we are coming now to uh, the concluding panel, panel number three, the expert panel, um, which will treat with questions of uh, cooperation, cooperation between uh, dealing with the past mechanisms and their archives, but also other kinds of cooperation uh, with civil society organization, with state actors, international organizations. So maybe um, this is a bit the panel where we can explore um, future ways how to deal with the problems um, that we, we've heard and the issues we've discussed in the previous panels. So. Um, Thank you for all those who stay until the very end <laughs> as less and less people, but um, there's a, a hard core still here, so thanks a lot. And of course, I would also like to thank the experts on uh, this panel who um, are also brave to be on the last panel. <laughs> they, they were forced to. <laughs> um, I would like to start with um, Trudy Peterson. Trudy had been mentioned, I think, almost on all the panels at least once. <laughs> so you see how important she is in this field. Um, Trudy is the president of the Human Rights Working Group of the International Council on Archives. But she is also uh, probably the archivist who, who has most experience in working with dealing with the past mechanisms, I dare to say, uh, with tribunals. Uh, truce commissions, um, claims boards, reparation commissions, and so on, all over the world. So um, we are very happy and very honored to have you here. Through this also, um, and we are very honored to say that um, a member of our advisory board, as is uh, Yasmin and uh, Patricia, the advisory board of the Archives and Dealing with the Past um, project. So. Um, we have here an expert who, who knows really uh, a lot and has a great overview of the topic. Then uh, to my right, um, Mr. Jean-Luc Blondel. He is the head of Archives and Information Management of the ICRC. He has joined the ICRC in 1982, uh, has worked in field missions also all over the world in El Salvador, Jerusalem, West Bank, Buenos Aires, um, Uruguay, Paraguay, Chile, and Bolivia. That means in countries uh, which we've heard uh, a lot already with have experience with truce commission and dealing with the past mechanisms. Uh, he had various positions at the headquarters of the ICRC in Geneva. And he was the dire director also of the International Tracing Service based in Bad Arolsen in Germany. And I'm sure he will uh, also talk about uh, this institution. Then uh, to my left, we have um, Vesna Terselic from Croatia. She is the director of the NGO Documenta. And uh, she has been working also on the issue of, of archives and also oral history, collecting testimonies of uh, victims um, for years. And uh, she has been active in the anti-war campaign in Croatia already, so for a long time involved in, in these issues. And I would also like to warmly welcome uh, Serge Rümer. He is the deputy head of the task force dealing with the past and prevention of atrocity of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland. He is specialized in change management in complex environments and has worked extensively in post-conflict contexts, focusing on institutional reform within the secretary, uh, secretary security, sorry. <laughs> and judiciary sectors for the last 18 years. Um, so he has also been working in dealing with the past uh, processes, uh, mainly reform of uh, security sector and also wetting processes. So thanks a lot for being uh, with us. And I would now like to give the floor uh, to Trudy. Elizabeth asked me to address the question of how can records of one kind of transitional justice institution be used in another transitional justice institution. 
When I first thought about it, I thought I didn't have anything to say. Then I decided I had too much to say. Um, I'm going to try to make seven very quick points. First of all, all of the records of transitional justice institutions can be used for historical, academic, and in that way, reparation kinds of activities or restoration activities. So without doubt, that's uh, there, and we can set that aside. I'm going to ca call four kinds of uh, transitional justice institutions as those that I think are most susceptible to cross-utilization. And that would be, of course, courts. Um, second would be vetting institutions. Third would be truth commissions. And fourth would be reparations or claims commissions. Of those, I think all three except vetting can also be used in memorialization activities, whether it is plaques, whether it is marking places that were used for detention, or other kinds of memorialization activities. I can't quite see how vetting records would be used there. So that's point one. Academics, history, we can use them all, and we can use most of them in memorialization. Point two. The nature of the materials is different in each of these cases, and therefore their use in the others differs. Truth commissions use the greatest variety of records because they are not limited by any kind of legal requirement for proof. Um, and so those can use any kind of records, personal papers, or documents they can find. Vetting is surely the most limited because that has to be records relating to exactly what a person was, did, or was empowered to do. And so in between those two, then you have a great difference in how they can be used in other cases. <clears throat> Point three, let me take a look then. Um, truth commissions, as I said, are the most flexible We've seen them used uh, as background for prosecution. We've seen them used in real prosecution as uh, the background of the statistical reports that were used in the Rio Smot trial came out of the Truth Commission in Guatemala. Um, we do see them used uh, specifically with subsidiary commissions or second commissions. Uh, as Patrick Walsh was just saying, there was a Truth Commission in Timor, and then there was a joint Indonesia-Timor Commission, which used the records of the first one. We're looking at Burundi. There was a Truth Commission in Burundi. If there's another one, that's another possibility. There have been two in South Korea. There have been three in Nepal. And so you see one commission wanting to know what the other did. This is also important because it helps us remember that the administration of a truth commission is equally important to the kind of things they collect on victims and events. Because there are questions as to the kinds of decision making that go on, as to what will be in a final report, what will be emphasized, what kind of cases will be investigated. And those administrative records are equally uh, important. If we look at courts, of course, subsidiary courts use the court records. Uh, you see the Bosnian court using records from ICTY, for example. Uh, you also see court records being used in compensation cases. We're now looking at the compensation board that's being set up in the Philippines. And while this is not directly a state case, um, after the end of the Marcos dictatorship, a class action of about 9,000 people sued Marcos in his exile in Hawaii. <clears throat> and the law establishing the compensation says that anyone who was part of that class action suit is automatically part of the compensation group. And so you can see that that case is going to get used in the compensation cases. Um, Compensation, restoration, reparations, files can be used in lots of different ways, including, of course, uh, truth commissions, though I would argue they typically come after rather than before a truth commission. Vetting is a more difficult case to see how it's going to be used. Uh, 
The one you can think about is in Germany, where denazification proceedings went on, and then subsequently um, people could be brought into court for having lied on the denazification proceeding or lied on an immigration proceeding. So you can see that all of these do have potential applications, if not uh, ones that we can point to directly. My fourth point, we've talked here about international courts and we've talked here about national institutions. I think it's important to point out that there is a middle ground that is uh, becoming equally important and that's the regional bodies. Um, the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights, the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights have been incredibly important in Brazil and in Guatemala cases and there is certainly the potential for the African Court on Human Rights to also be important. And as we look at preserving the records of institutions of transitional justice, we must be aware that we have to pressure the regional institutions as well to do right by their archives. Point five, what are the limits here? Well, there are the ones we've been talking about all day. But the first are the agreements that are indeed made with the people who provide documents or who provide evidence or who provide testimony, whether to any one of these uh, institutions. Um, I'm a conservative on privacy. I believe that if a state has damaged the privacy of an individual or damaged the individual in some way, we should do everything we can not to damage them further by spreading their information in the public. I am very much unhappy with the decision of the police archives in Guatemala to put their entire raw files on the University of Texas website. I am convinced people will be killed in Guatemala by people sitting and looking at those records and taking out a contract on someone's life. Um, so I think we have to be enormously careful both about the agreements that are made, for example, agreements made with institutions to provide institutional records for use of these kinds of uh, transitional justice processes and individual privacy. Point six, something I think uh, Yasmin alluded to this morning, and that is we have still an ongoing question of the records of the United Nations War Crimes Commission uh, that was formed toward the end of World War II to try to identify people who uh, were perhaps perpetrators of war crimes. Those records are in the UN in New York. They are under an agreement that was made in the, at the, I think, 47, and then was revised in the mid-80s. There's great pressure now to open those records entirely. In fact, there's a conference on it in September. And yet we have unsubstantiated allegations in there about living people. And I think it behooves us all to watch what's going to happen with the records of the UN War Crimes Commission. You can get at them for research. Uh, there is a protocol for doing it, but they aren't all open and available. And the final point seven, the International Council on Archives last August adopted a basic policy statement on principles of access to archives. And I'm really delighted that the sixth principle says that even if archives are not open to the general public for human rights needs, you can get access. Now, this is not enforceable in a court of law, but it is an authoritative statement from the world's archival, biggest archival body saying human rights Access to archives is possible in archival holdings, even if the general public doesn't have it. Thank you very much, Trudy. I would now like to give the floor um, to Mr. Blondel. Um, sure. We know the ICRC is quite reluctant 
maybe to give out information. This is the, in the impression that is given. <laughs> I've been working with the ICRC myself. But um, you, you said no. <laughs> and I know um, the ICRC is cooperating with uh, transitional justice mechanisms. You yourself, the ICRC, does important uh, dealing with the past work, mainly with the issue of missing persons. What are your experiences? How is the ICRC cooperating, using other archives of dealing with the past mechanisms? OK, you, you understood in this panel we have only solutions. <laughs> uh, and um, now I said, no, because that we're not reluctant. We, we are prudent. In, in the same way as Trudy said, uh, for certain, for the protection of certain people. But on another way, we're absolutely open. Uh, I mean, you have to balance uh, uh, these. As far as I understand the, the debates, the archives, certainly not sexy, but um, I, I'm not, uh, no, I, somebody said, but I think we are sexy. Uh, they're not the problem. It's the problem is the other. Uh, our duty as archivists is to collect, to organize, and to give access to the archives. Uh, this is our job. Um, other instances, authorities, are uh, more in, uh, are creating more difficulties, I would say. Uh, and, um, but the first duty, certainly for archivists, that is to have records. Um, I was uh, I'm aware of, uh, of many organizations, including people, organization of people represented here, that you start a project, but you do not think you could have success. And years after, you would like to know where I'm coming from, what do I have. And if you have not thought early enough, it's also relatively difficult to find uh, uh, documents. Um, as Elisabeth said, I was over the four past years I was in Germany as a director of the last ICRC, nominated director of the International Tracing Service, where an institution was created immediately after the war, the Second World War. After the war, it doesn't mean anything, there's always wars. Um, and uh, having uh, 30 million documents uh, relating to 70, 17 million people, uh, all on the persecutions of Nazi Germany. Uh, and this institution was not open to the public until the end of 2007. So I was lucky enough to be the director of the opening. Um, and this institution was instrumental uh, for in the beginning and still today to give information to families or to the concerned people themselves. I mentioned 17 million names are registered. Uh, but also we gave evidence for tribunals mainly to identify witnesses. I mean, if you are a victim, you are a potential witness to a, a trial. Uh, in cases against war criminals. And the last document we transmitted was uh, Demjanjuk uh, trial in München. Um, also, to give documents uh, to memorials to help them in their own uh, work. And of course, it was very useful for thousands and thousands of persons to get compensation from Germany for whatever they have suffered. But um, in this relation, I'd like to quote uh, Thomas Bürgenthal. I mean, the, the name is known, uh, former judge at the International Court of Justice, and he was active in Latin America in the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights and the Truth Commission in El Salvador. And I was moved, and I was honored and moved to give him the documents relating to himself to his father, to his, who died in Buchenwald, uh, and to uh, his mother. And he said, he was in a ceremony by Aholson, and he said, this archives, but it could apply to other archives, 
it's not only a place where you can you can f find documents. This is for me the only place where I saw something about my father. There is no grave, uh, nothing, nowhere. Uh, this is uh, this is a memorial. Um, I think it is. Uh, if we relate to, to human rights and, and justice, uh, we have to be uh, aware of the high relevance of our work and of the archives uh, we, uh, we have. A few examples of, of uh, cooperation. I, I'm only four months in my office in, in Geneva, but I was a a frequent user of, of archives, so I, I'm, uh, I know what, what we have. Um, we sent someone 2011, 2012 to various archives of ICTY, uh, the OSCE, uh, the core archives, and this was a legal expert who reviewed all the documents to find information on missing persons we were, as ICRC, looking for. And he was quite successful. Uh, we could, got, we could get a lot of on, on in complementary informations or unique informations. Uh, I mean, we all know that you can find in archives, isn't that, sometimes they are hidden, <laughs> sometimes they're just here, nobody went through. Uh, and if you take the time, uh, to go through, you can uh, find uh, many information. It was, it was a, a good example, but it was also necessary to have somebody who is able to, to read different languages uh, and uh, familiar with legal issues. Um, since the past few years, uh, we are, especially in Latin America, but in the Balkans as well, working on missings and uh, establishing data, databases on biological reference support items. I mean, uh, DNA analysis, as you know, is a helpful tool to identify relatives, um, but you also need to organize this material. Um, and uh, the ICRC, thanks to uh, different experts, established a database which is uh, uh, peu à peu uh, used in various countries like Peru, Colombia, or even Guatemala was mentioned here uh, today. And as we speak, uh, I would have met these people in Geneva today from the Servicio Medico Legal de, de Chile. Uh, we are establishing an agreement that the ICRC uh, will have a deposit of the material on uh, one of the four, four copies, so to speak. Um, and it was the wish of families uh, in, in Chile, but the government also agreed. Uh, and one deposit will be at the ICRC archives. As security. Um, another way to, to help uh, historical research or, or legal research is um, to provide copies of former correspondence. Uh, maybe dictatorships are not very careful in keeping their own archives in, in order. <laughs> And uh, I have myself, when I was delegate in Latin America, made copies of reports of the ICRC to the same authorities who were not able to find their own uh, documents. Um, and uh, recently, you know, it was four years ago, uh, Spain made a copy of all ICRC archives on the S uh, Spanish Civil War, and they are in uh, we understood they're not that available, but they are available in Spain. And it's something I personally would support very strongly for all possible cases. Uh, but they, they're public archives, so you can read them in Geneva, but if, it is, if the country is too far away, uh, the copy of 
these documents can be made at, uh, in Geneva and, and be available in different places. What was what done in the, the, for the International Tracing Service files, uh, United States, UK, France, uh, Belgium, uh, Israel, uh, in particular, have a copy of the same collections. So they can uh, be consulted in other uh, places. The ICRC deadline um, for consulate archives is 40 years. Uh, for general documents and 60 years uh, when you have personal data. But if you are victims or a next of skin of victims, you have immediately access to the, the documents on, your, on yourself. Um, I mean, you, I think we have, especially in a humanitarian organization, to differentiate between the persons we are supposed to help and historian or journalists. And uh, of course, the service to the victims during a conflict goes beyond the conflict in giving, for example, a certificate of detention thing that, yes, you have been imprisoned uh, during this, this period. And you can, this person can use this piece of paper for many purposes. Um, a couple of remarks on, on, on challenges for cooperation. I think uh, also listening to you the, today, um, the combination of, of uh, mechanisms needs to have a combination of different forces. Uh, you certainly need the government in a way or another. Uh, the NGO alone, I mean, of course there is merit for NGOs, but in these issues, it's good to have a little bit of official uh, um, participation, NGOs, and it is a plus to have an international organization linked, uh, more or less, uh, to this process. Um, and I would uh, invite this, especially NGOs, to show more cooperation among themselves. I mean, this, this is also a field of competition, a lack of transparency among uh, certain uh, NGOs, and it makes the, the work probably sometimes unnecessarily complex and, and uh, slow. Uh, that's all for the first talk. Thank you very much, and thank you especially for giving me uh, the, the keyword for my next question. Um, Vesna, I asked you to exactly look at this issue. Uh, how is the perspective from civil society organizations, um, cooperation among themselves? I know you are representing different NGOs in Croatia. And uh, also cooperation with international tribunals is uh, definitely an issue uh, in your context. Uh, we heard how difficult it is in, in other contexts to get access to these documents. Maybe you can talk a bit about how you actually get access, for example, to ICTY uh, archives for your work or to um, archives of tribunals, national tribunals, and, and how you use it. And, and that's A lot of questions. <laughs> so I'll uh, start with... Uh, the reason why Documenta was established, and it was really to collect, to organize, to give access, and eventually make a fate of victims visible in the public. And it is that uh, we have started as joint effort of two human rights and two peace organizations with large documentations. And on first place, these four organizations wanted to protect their own documentation and developed it further. Uh, to ensure uh, that uh, research will go on. So we have been established not so many years ago, in 2004, and in 2005, three of founding organizations together, we have started systematic monitoring of war crimes trials. And I would say that uh, cooperation with judicial institutions, either courts, uh, county courts, Supreme Court, state attorney in Croatia remains a single most important uh, 
cooperation uh, in sense of access to documentation which we have because one of important products of our work is that what courts do and they can only do themselves uh, we actually uh, make visible in a way that uh, on our web pages we publish who the proceedings from indictment to uh, reports from uh, every single session uh, first level verdict supreme court decision if there was a retrial again all documentation related to the retrial to the final word of supreme court or if there was not a final word maybe constitutional court had to say something and in some cases also uh, European uh, Court for Human Rights so it's that uh, this documentation uh, regarding war crimes trials in Croatia it's simply not available on other places it is not available in uh, Croatian state archive it is not available on the web page of Ministry of Justice uh, it is not available on pages of particular courts although they work transparently uh, but it's just that otherwise it would be fragmented so there was a very simple need to put it together on one place and this is sort of outcome of our monitoring effort which always uh, goes along the motto of supportive criticism because what courts do it's uh, it's a task which is essential and uh, victims and survivors always expect most from the courts they want justice they want in their case the justice is seen regarding either killing or any other gross violation of human rights and uh, this is the first thing which they expect and in framework uh, which is contextualized with realizing right to truth, right to justice, right to reparations and guarantee of non-reoccurrence. For survivors, in my experience, justice is always the most important. But after uh, 20 years have passed from the beginning of uh, wars in post-Yugoslav countries, I have to say that we are clearly aware that only small number of cases uh, will be actually dealt through judicial proceedings being uh, in uh, uh, international tribunal uh, what Nerma was telling more today about or in uh, courts in Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia or other post Yugoslav countries. Uh, that's why civil society organizations have started initiative uh, which is complementary being initiative for ECOM and in that initiative we hoped that states will establish commission a truth commission which would continue with research uh, in uh, gross violations of human rights uh, using same methodology in all post Yugoslav countries uh, we are still campaigning for that initiative so uh, it is that now we expect uh, representatives of presidents of post Yugoslav republics and presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina to meet and give their opinion on proposed statute of RECOM. So one civil society initiative reached the stage in which we have transferred it to uh, the governments and to the presidents in 2011. Why I'm telling you about RECOM? So that you are aware that uh, there is an effort to eventually build complementary mechanism what civil society initiative can do is propose this to governments we cannot do much more but in case RECOM would be established again the ongoing research of human rights organizations in human losses and establishing facts about fate of uh, killed and missing uh, would serve as a base for such advanced mechanism will it be established or not I don't know I hope it will be because uh, there is a need to see a justice beside criminal justice and I would say that families and our societies have right to see more than criminal justice but uh, it is on governments and presidents to decide concerning uh, cooperation uh, with governmental institutions uh, I have to say that we very often use a law on access and freedom of information uh, sometimes with success and sometimes with no success uh, one limitation uh, in Croatia which is very serious is that basically for historians if they want to see documentation which is put it in quotes younger than 50 years 
actually they have no ground uh, to demand it from the archive. And currently we are just preparing an initiative together with uh, historians from Faculty of Humanities in Zagreb, because this is a real obstacle, not just to the victims, but to scientific work. So is that, uh, legally speaking, there are obstacles uh, which we might address together also on uh, international level. And there are lessons to be learned from other countries. Uh, I would say that uh, human rights organizations uh, do our own collecting work. And uh, it's actually that uh, with modern technology and information systems, we hope to be able to eventually publish on our web pages not just what has been processed in the courts, but also to portray a fate of victims from the violent incident to eventual judicial uh, resolution uh, or uh, lack of any kind of judicial proceedings. Uh, but uh, this is still a challenge and we are developing uh, information systems together with Humanitarian Law Center from Belgrade and uh, Pristina with support of uh, Swiss government because there are challenges and uh, it is that uh, eventually it would be very important for our societies to see fate of victims from the moment when eventual crime was committed uh, and to see on their own mm. when the action was taken by courts and when it was not taken. Uh, we are also recording personal memories uh, and plan to publish uh, at least part of our video collection, which now has 400 interviews with transcripts uh, in Croatian and English in September this year. But that is uh, uh, a huge challenge and I'm excited about the moment when these interviews will be published. And they cover a period from 1930s on. They don't cover only uh, the 90s. Uh, but uh, as a people with whom we have spoken, as our narrators are still alive, we are not really sure that all of them are aware what it means when such collection is published on internet. And uh, period after publishing uh, will be very important for evaluation because some of them are uh, eventual survivors, some are protagonists of events. So it's a broad specter of social protagonists who have spoken. And it actually uh, will hopefully contribute to creating an atmosphere in which uh, various interpretations uh, will become more acceptable because multi-perspectivity is not something yet typical of our societies. In post-war societies, uh, the challenge of having one dominant narration of what happened, which is normally one-sided, or having different narrations contra each other, uh, it's difficult and in a collection of personal memories which we have already uh, uh, recorded, it's very visible how different are perspectives. And uh, there are so many different ways how individual people see what happened and how it felt to them. So it's that this is something uh, what can help to promoting multi-perspectivity uh, in our societies in the future. Uh, I would uh, like to say that much more could be done uh, in sense of uh, support of governments to uh, ensuring access to archives. Uh, when uh, Nerma Jelacic from uh, International Criminal Court was uh, speaking, I was hoping that in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia will soon see uh, the information centers uh, regarding a tribunal. But as planning Croatia is uh, that the center might be established uh, in a faculty of law, I'm afraid that not many people will come and actually look through what is there. Uh, and I'm quite aware that not everyone has internet because International Criminal uh, Court for War Crimes in former Yugoslavia made a huge effort to put a lot of uh, documentation on internet, but this is not accessible to everyone. So the cooperation with civil society organizations there is essential. I would even say cooperation with artists uh, we, uh, we find that uh, exhibitions uh, and uh, art performances or uh, theater plays are actually also important channel, often much more visible, not to mention a film, as uh, uh, the, the art form which is really reaching far out. 
Uh, and I believe that artists and work, they need you know, build, to build stories on the facts. So here, beside uh, the uh, obligation of states to invest actually in making archives more accessible, and so much can be done to make them more accessible, I would also like to stress how important would be the inter international organizations and intergovernmental organizations also invest in uh, making their uh, archives more accessible. What happened in uh, Croatia and in other post-Yugoslav countries is that uh, sometimes huge institutions have been eventually uh, preparing and implementing a very important research in uh, gross violations of human rights, and it was simply shredded. So it's that uh, here I would like to point out one good example that uh, OSC uh, mission in Croatia, when leaving, eventually they have given copies of uh, documentation to uh, free human rights organizations. I think that's a unique example. And it's something what I would hope in the future some other intergovernmental or international organizations would do mm -hmm. also, because it is that Last year, we have prepared a campaign uh, regarding fate of civilian victims, uh, with simple title that civilian victims have waited far too long. And in order to prepare that, huge documentation and cooperation of a lot of institutions were needed. What we published are eight stories of uh, eight civilian victims, uh, Croats and Serbs from Croatia. And this was very understandable for public. It was broadcasted uh, by uh, commercial and public television for free. So it's that uh, to prepare such a campaign, to make fatal victims visible uh, in that way, uh, it's really that a lot of archives, governmental institutions and human rights organizations have to do things in cooperation. So it's that uh, this kind of cooperation can uh, contribute to increased visibility of fate of uh, the ones who have been killed or are still suffering consequences of gross human rights violations. And I would really uh, appeal both on representatives of Swiss government but also to governments everywhere in the world because I hope that there will be recommendations which will reach also other governments uh, to eventually uh, understand that concerning uh, war crimes and uh, violations of humanitarian law, it is not enough uh, for heads of states uh, or presidents of states to go on uh, places of massacres once a year and pay respect. Much more is needed. And the base of that uh, serious uh, work uh, of realizing right to truth, right to justice and uh, reparations is eventually exactly in the archives because that's where documentation is and uh, there is a key for implementing maybe uh, a special right which I would like to underline uh, as a priority and that is the right of uh, young generations to learn history based on facts. Uh, it is that guarantee that uh, uh, young generation can learn that. Uh, it's only if there is documentation, if it's preserved, and if gradually gets increased and more accessible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vesna. And you also gave uh, an important uh, keyword. Um, I would like to uh, ask uh, Serge um, the role of states. Uh, on the one hand, states who, like Switzerland, who are supporting dealing with the past mechanisms, uh, who put considerable amounts of money also in those um, mechanisms. What is the thinking about the future? And I know Switzerland, with this initiative, um, the archives and dealing with the past did an important step already. And the other, what really is your, your expertise and your um, experiences, uh, how or what role do archives play in a, in a broader dealing with the past issue, which is um, reforms, uh, security sector reforms, vetting. How um, do these um, processes use archives of 
um, truth commissions, are they using these archives at all? Do you have experiences that are there uh, corporations? Is there a use actually um, in uh, democratic transition processes um, getting back to, to uh, documentation of tribunals and uh, truth commissions? Thank you. Okay, um, so I will start from the last, okay, and I will uh, I will uh, talk about the vetting and the archives and the vetting processes, how it can link or not with other uh, mechanisms. Uh, so first of all, when we talk a bit about vetting, we talk about uh, here about a process for assessing an individual integrity as a means of determining her or his suitability for public employment when we talk about vetting. In the Eastern Europe, it was called lustration. Um, when we talk about vetting in archives, it's very important to differentiate the context in terms of are we dealing with a post-authoritarian or a post-conflict environment. It makes a big difference. In the post-authoritarian transition, you have continuity of institution, structure, infrastructure are maintained, which means also that uh, the volume of archive also can be can be uh, maintained and accessible. While in a post-conflict, everything has been uh, destroyed, infrastructure, also structure, and also uh, archives, even uh, personnel who has the, who had the skill and experience is either not there anymore or displaced, and so it's also a skill which is missing when we talk about the, the digging into archives. Uh, I will not talk too much about post-authoritarian uh, because it's uh, domestic processes and, uh, and, if, and if we talk about, for example, the illustration in the Eastern Europe, uh, very little uh, link with uh, uh, other transitional justice mechanisms. But just to give a perfume of what we mean, and we mean about uh, uh, these processes, I would like to bring some, some numbers that I think are important. Uh, if we talk the, the process about the process in um, East Germany, there was established uh, an office for the Stasi file in 1990s to preserve and uh, two dimension then. And also you could file a complaint and get information about yourself. And also this was also assessing the, the, the past of the people in the institution or how much or not they were linked to the Stasi and see if they can stay or not in office. In 2010, there are still 1,000, around 1,700 people employed for this process, 20 years later. Okay, today is still running, I think. And uh, we are talking about 180 kilometers of archive, codified archive, and there is somehow, definitely, there is a big, a huge historical value, because just the volume of information represents the magnitude, give a sense of the uh, the, the system that was in place to produce all this type of information. But strangely, um, also it was thought that the, the truth will come from this archive, which is very difficult. You need, this is codified, we are codified, we are complex archive, you need skills, technicians, which means you need to rely on people who were working on this archive before, on this knowledge, past knowledge to access and to process this archive. And also, secondly, they were uh, created under illicit, uh, uh, um, illicit um, uh, methodology. I mean, the pressure on people, you will find information which is not true. I will give information to you because maybe I'm involved with an illicit, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, cheating on my wife and you know it, and then you pressure me to get some information. So I will give you information just so, and I'm obliged to give you information, but this information maybe is not reliable or not true, but the important that I gave you information. So this is not something which is good for, for telling the truth. So just to give a sense of uh, what it means to dig, dig into this big, big uh, archive and the uh, illusion that may create expectations or we can create. And also if you think of somebody who was working in the, in the government and then was linked to Stasi, but then spent, after 20 years, they spent more years in office in the new regime rather than maybe only five years in the post regime. So what do you balance in terms of attitude? So just a point. When, when we talk about post-conflict, what is important in post-conflict, if you want to do vetting, is that it's very difficult to have, I mean, you don't have, a, you don't have a files. So the, if you talk about vetting the police, uh, most of the time the police are a mix of former police and new uh, former rebel put into the 
police or in the army, uh, the, the files are not available. So you need to recreate a full system. If you think about Liberia, for example, or two, I will talk about two processes I was involved. In Liberia, the, uh, the agreement said that we need to establish, just after the peace agreement, an interim police. And what's very important politically is to have a police which was not the tail of faces, what's mixed police. But how do you do when you don't have archives, you don't have files? So we had to rely, I mean, the United Nations had to rely to the chief of personnel was there, were giving a list of people. Without archive, this is the best you can do. But on the other hand, if we had uh, personal files, would we, would, have find, would we have found the right information that allow us to vet for these people? Certainly we will not. So, so which means we have to balance the, 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 the fact that we don't have archive, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem in this case, because we have to hurry, we have to go very fast, and there is a pressure, political pressure to establish a police, but on the other hand, you don't have really the time to vet. Now, I'll talk to a, a more um, fleshy example, the, the Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, in, uh, in 95, was the, the Dayton Agreement established in the, in the annex a mandate for the UN to uh, reform the, the support of the reform of the police. And uh, the, done that was, the, the, the mandate was then beef up to, uh, to um, human rights investigation at some point also. Uh, we got a vetting mandate in this mission. Why did we get this vetting mandate? Because we did an audit in a police station in Stolats where we had lots of violations. And instead of still in, uh, investigating the violations by the police, at some point we shift attitude and investigate the police station. And investigate the police station doing an audit, we uh, uh, engage in the station and photocopy all the documentation that was there. It was only, only three years and a half, but we found the payroll. And the payroll varies, was very enlightening. Because just for the payroll, we could establish that the number of people that the, 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 the ministry was declaring and names was absolutely not, not concording with what we had on payroll. The number was bigger, and with people who actually were based in Zagreb and receiving uh, payroll while they were in Bosnia, so allegedly police officers. And this is, uh, this is what has triggered a mandate by the Security Council to certify all the police in Bosnia. We're talking about 20,000 people. So we engaged in screening 20,000 people. And so building an archive by registering all these people and trying to find information and, and uh, uh, setting criteria to vet the person to, uh, to see if they could or not stay in office. But what do you base your information on? So we collect information through a questionnaire. We received a lot of information from uh, international organizations, NGOs, human rights organizations. But what do you do with a report from an international human rights organization. Is it fair enough to come and say, well, you cannot be a police officer because this human rights organization said you were beating people in a cell for the last three years and torturing a minority? Is, is not enough. You know, it's also the legal base behind it that also shape the type of archive, the type of information you need to collect to do the, to, to, to do the process. Anyway, we engage in this process. We talk about 20,000 police officers separate into 14 police administrations, different administrations you had to deal with. And we build this big archive and uh, screen the, 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 the personnel. And in the end, we had a national archive because we had everybody. But what do you do with this archive? Because you cannot hand it over to any uh, national institution because there's not national police. So we have built something which was national, while there is national, no national counterpart on the other side to receive the archive when we finish the process. So what happened with this, uh, the, the archive is, I will, I will tell you just after. Also, when you um, get information, finally we, we were a little bit desperate with the type of information we could get, and with ICTY was established, yes, we're gonna have information and link with ICTY. So we managed with the prosecutorial office to have two police, uh, Dutch police officer position in the prosecutor office in the ICTY. And so we were sending all the list of police officers, sending it to ICTI, but 
negotiation with the prosecutor office was really difficult and of course was the legal issues. There was lots of vacuum in terms of gray area, you know, in terms of legal, because the first time we are doing this, you know, with uh, under chapter seven of the UN, uh, and this is ICTY, you know, how do you, what does it mean in terms of law, or what kind of relationship you can engage. So what happens is that we are sending names and we receive information, say, hit. Hit, it means that the name appears in the database. And so, we have it, that's it. We don't know, maybe this, was, this person was a witness, and also we don't even know if it's the same person, but the same people has the same name. And also as a foreigner, we're collecting the information, and in, in, the, in the Serbian area, it's Cyrillic, also the, 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 the alphabet has more letter, and uh, so we were translating the letter in the Latinic alphabet, so of course, name was screwed up. Uh, so we had a lot of problem by uh, using, and a lot of people having the same name also. So and without the date of birth, you, you don't you don't know how to do with it. Anyway, we managed to do this process, but for the, the purpose of the, our our discussion, what happened with the the, the 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 database is that after the UN, the EU was established established a mission. So the UN, we thought, okay, we can hand over the database to EU to continue. But the EU thought it was not its mandate and say, no, we don't want the database. We don't want the information, we don't want the archives. So what happened is that the UN administration took over and say anything that is in the UN should go back to New York. So the database, all the files, written files, with all information, plus additional information collected through media report or NGO organization, to Long Island in a container. By the day the UN left, there is no more record on the police. After seven years, uh, after 10 years of, uh, of work, collecting information of the police officer, there was not a single information left in the country. Only information we collect. So, <coughs> some police officer complained and filed a, filed a, a case to the court saying they were being kicked out by the ministry without legal ground. And uh, the ministry said, yeah, but the UN told us so we have to be fired. Yes, but we don't know the UN in, in Bosnian law. And this became a big issue. And uh, it tried to reopen the case, but you could not reopen the case because everything was in Long Island on the container. You could not look into that. So in the end, it was in a way they found a smart way to deal with it. I will not enter into the, into the, the complexity of the legal issues, but this was sorted out uh, many, many years. It took many, many years. Uh, to, to sort out of this issue, but still data were archived were not open anymore. This called me for a question. We have the office of the high representative in Bosnia. It's now uh, 20 years, uh, almost 20 years, uh, no, 30 years, yeah? 20, uh, 20 sorry, uh, 95, 2005, right? 20 years, is there, ruling the country. What's going to happen with uh, the, 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 the database of the high representative? There's very sensitive information, interesting information. Some people have been banned to, from office, dismissed by a signature of the high representative, politically the leaders, based on some files, some information collected. And so this is the patrimony of, uh, of, of Bosnia. This is part of the history of Bosnia. So, will be, so uh, it will be interesting to see how they think about the issue. Now, when we talk about vetting and other mechanism, I will finish on that, is that what will be interesting for a vetting process is to have a truth commission before, mm. and through the truth commission information, you will have a better understanding of the functioning of the institutions, how institutions were involved, and better recontextualize mm. some units work, you know, so, uh, paramilitary, blah, 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 uh, so, so great police or other organs involved in the, uh, in the human rights uh, abuses, to then to recontextualize re, uh, the, 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 the curses, the, the background of this uh, person being part of an institution and give already some insight or this person was close or not to violations, whatever. This would be useful. But what's happening, especially in post-conflict, um, in the, where you have uh, heavy international involvement, is you need to establish a police now. By day one you are there, you need to train, you need to establish a police, you need to establish uh, an army. So you have no time to build this background and no way you can have uh, this information. So structurally there is a, a problem here that unfortunately uh, 
I'm afraid it cannot be solved, but this is the way how it works, but it will be very useful if it will work or the other day uh, around. Now, I will finish uh, on this for dealing with the past. Certainly, uh, the way um, it is approached and uh, the, the overall, uh, the holistic approach of the of the dealing with the past in the, by, by the Swiss Federal Department, uh, archive plays a very, very important role. We are just back from uh, from a session in South Africa where we spoke with uh, Zimbabwean uh, civil society there. There is a remarkable work uh, done by this, uh, the, the civil society and certainly is one of the unique activity that they can run on the ground and prepare for uh, what could be uh, in the future without necessarily knowing what would be the future. But this is certainly one of the unique, uh, yeah, uh, I would say powerful uh, uh, involvement and that uh, will have uh, an impact on, on the future. So definitely uh, it's something which is, I am very happy now uh, seeing this panel, the people are, are also coming here in the, the audience, that this is something that start to, to emerge and there is a, a broader attention to, to, to this issue. But we, um, as a federal part, will pay a big, a big, uh, and more express it. I will not uh, uh, comment what she said, but it's certainly one of the, of the, of the pillar of, uh, of uh, the, the, the way we approach uh, dealing with the past. Thank you very much. I um, have plenty of questions here, but I uh, would like to give uh, you the word. Um, I think there are probably many questions, and um, we're also cut a bit into um, the time of my concluding remarks because I will not take uh, 15 minutes for those. So take your time um, for questions. Too tired. <laughs> Thank you very much. My question is directed to the second point that Trudy made. And, um, I would like to say I appreciate um, the work that has gone into the work of the IC, the Human Rights Working Group on the 10 Principles of Access. It, um, really, it's very helpful you know, to, in developing an access policy. But you did mention there about the nature of the materials being different you know, for the different um, users are the different context of, um, of these records in the context of truth commissions. You mentioned the point that the materials that like all kinds of materials are acceptable within the context of um, the truth commission, which is not the case with um, the courts, for instance. But sometimes there are these um, records that falls into the category of truth commissions. Those are records, for instance, of fact-finding missions or commissions of uh, inquiry who are sent you know, to investigate what is happening on ground and to come up with a determination that what they have, you know, it's um, a violation and could go on further. And sometimes we have this kind of records being used as a basis for prosecution by international um, justice mechanism or regional justice, uh, justice mechanism. And then it now calls to question some the, how those records are collected. Because within the context of the court, everything matters. The way it is collected, the chain of custody, and um, um, all, you know, all those issues are, are important. Administrative, like you mentioned, um, administrative aspects of those records become important details. So when they are used that way and we have that, those kind of transition, then shouldn't there be some guidelines about how those records are collected? Some guidelines that would make them usable in all the different kind of contests, you know, that they could possibly be used for in the future. And secondly, there are gaps in the involvement of archivists with, you know, um, the major players in determining the activities of these justice and mechanisms. Most of the time, they're legal experts and, um, and human rights experts who are involved in the process, and they do leave out some very important gaps that um, could help to authenticate the records that are created to make them acceptably 
um, used in different kind of context and archivists do have a futuristic view of the possible uses of records but most often than not their involvement are missing in those aspects. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to try to make three points out of that. Um, first, when a commission of investigation, and think of the Sharif Bassiouni investigation that led to the creation of ICTY, those records were transferred to ICTY. They're a special body within ICTY. I hope I'm telling the truth still for ICTY, but the last time I knew, they were a special body. But the archival principle is last current use determines access. Last current use determines how they will be managed. And so once you absorb a body from another institution, whether it's a vetting institution or a truth commission or an investigatory mission, uh, commission, into some other institution and it becomes part of that, then that's part of those records and is administered similarly. It's different when you get Xerox copies. I mean, we heard uh, both uh, Catherine and Patricia talk about getting copies of documents which they absorb then into their institution. But the originals are back in um, the place from which they came. That's different. But if you really take the whole thing in and it becomes part, then it's last current use. So that's, that's one thing. Second thing I'd say, maybe it's only two points. Um, I am very concerned about what happens to the personal papers of people who are involved in these uh, transitional justice institutions. And I think it behooves every court to know where the judges are, where the prosecutors and senior prosecutors are, and where they're depositing their personal papers. I know a judge who took uh, records from an international court. I believe I know a prosecutor who's taken things. I believe I know an investigator who has things. Yes, there are rules against it. But people have what they consider their personal copies, their personal diaries. These are very sensitive materials sometimes. They may then decide, gee, I'm going to donate this to my alma mater. And then they walk across the street, get hit by a truck, and die. Bingo, those records are at the alma mater. And they may be open in a way that neither the uh, tribunal wishes, nor do the people whose things are in there. You have to hope that none of those things uh, occur. But I really, really believe that especially the international courts need to know what kind of arrangements their senior staff are making for their personal papers and just keep like a big Rolodex in the sky so you know where they are. Thank you very much. More questions? Um, I'm again soliciting Trudy and maybe Sir. You share with us uh, this example where the archives was uh, placed in an um, American university. Yeah. And due to matter of privacy, maybe life of people could be put in danger. Mm -hmm. And I am thinking on the process in Burundi or somewhere else, where there are lots of fears about the seriousness of the authorities. And people are thinking that uh, if they testify before the commission, and there is a provision that the um, archives of the commission could be used by a tribunal, it will be a serious issue. And I would like to know your view about do we need to say, or do we really need that the uh, archives of a truth commission be used by a tribunal? Okay, I think there are two questions in here as well. One is when you need to get a security copy out of the country, 
to make sure that the original isn't in danger of either natural causes or being tampered with or being destroyed in some way by uh, government action. And in those cases, you're looking for Switzerland, which holds the digital copy of the police archives in Guatemala. Uh, Finland holds a digital copy of some very important records in uh, Lebanon on who was killed during the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, Finland also holds, I believe, the, the actually the originals in that case of Mate Atasari's uh, commission looking at the Kyrgyz um, conflict a couple of years ago. So you're looking for somebody who will be, if you'll let me say, a Swiss bank vault. You don't provide access, but you provide a security copy in a trusted digital environment so that that set of records is safe no matter what happens to the, uh, the copy in the country. I'm not crazy about this uh, as an option for every case, but in cases like I'm working right now in the Marshall Islands on the Nuclear Claims Tribunal, there's no other option I can find. So I have to find a trusted digital repository in a different geographic location. There's just no other option. So that's one. The other question I think that's buried here is when you have a truth commission and a court in the same country and are they running at the same time or are they running sequentially and what access does one get to the other. I've tried a little chart for myself to see if all four of those transitional justice mechanisms, that is court, vetting, um, truth commission, and a reparation commission. If I can figure out one country which has all four, I can figure out countries that have three, but I don't know, and somebody in the audience may, of a country that does all four. And so what you start to see is you start to see in each case um, a negotiation between the previous and the subsequent on how that record can be used. For example, in Sierra Leone, the court was very clear that they would use nothing that came out of the Truth Commission. They, they just would not do it. Um, whereas in Guatemala, you were able to use at least some of the publicly available things from the Truth Commission into the litigation. So I think that's a one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Somebody else wants to answer one of these questions or add something? I think then we would have one last wrap-up question, a very short one to all of you. If you had one open wish with regard to archives of dealing with the past mechanisms, um, apart from finances, <laughs> we heard that, I think, very clearly in all the panels, uh, what would it be? No, I think the wish I have is the one I just expressed uh, just before. I am very happy that we are now more and more discussing these issues, that uh, human rights organizations are more and more... Uh, it's also a way of, of putting... You know, what, what I think is, is to, to, to understand is that when there is a regime, there is a massive abuse, when there are violations, what we don't know is when it will be useful, but what we know is that time will change. At some point, we will have a use of this information collected. So this is a certainty. It may take five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. But this, at some point, will be useful, either for the same generation or for the future generation. So something we need to transmit is a kind of a hope and the 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 the, 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 yes, the treasure that is it's uh, is, is around the, sometimes it's just under the eyes but in collecting and uh, building this archive this is something we need to to yes to transmit this hope that one day this will be very useful well my wish is uh, very much a policy wish so that uh, in uh, 
policies of uh, governments, uh, there would be a space for uh, dealing with the past, Swiss government being only one having it in its foreign policy. I think uh, it should inspire some other governments to follow the path, and then there would be a place for aircrafts also. But internationally speaking, uh, I really believe that procedure done by International Tribunal for War Crimes in former Yugoslavia, in which a fate of aircraft was discussed, should become a pattern. So it's that it's it's a high time to address this issue for office uh, of high representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also for, for example, OSCE missions. Uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe had its missions or still has its missions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, etc. Wherever international organizations are particularly engaged in, uh, you know, either monitoring uh, reform of judiciary or uh, observing and monitoring human rights situation, there should be a question, what will happen with their archives, where that goes? Because I have seen so many uh, length meters of documentation shredded and it's irrecoverable. So that, that would be my wish. Thank you. I have no wish <laughs> as archivist, <laughs> uh, but for the, for the other. I mean, I, we heard there is a tension between truth and justice and, and peace. I mean, with, for the sake of peace, don't go too far in justice and in investigation. We might understand this in a very short time, but it is absolutely absurd on the long term. And uh, only a society which goes through the process of truth can be on the long term in peace with itself. Um, with itself, always neighbors. Um, I have to say, I was m many years in Germany and the, the work done in the beginning forced by allies, but after very sincere of investigation of their own past. If I compare with another actor of the same war, Japan, I regret that is not one centimeter of investigation of the past responsibilities in other countries and it hinder peace uh, to a large extent. And so my wish is that politics do the same as we do as archivists to help uh, for the truth. Thank you. My wish would be that every country would have a national archive system and that system would both preserve and protect uh, records of government and in a part of the system preserve and protect the records of non-government and personal materials. And I wish that the National Archives would be professionalized and strengthened so that they could play the part in government that we need them to play. I wish governments, when they appoint a National Archivist, would think about the care they use in appointing judges and think about the archivist as the judge of the records of the people's past and how much that means. Thank you very much. And I don't want to add too much to those uh, closing remarks of our experts. I think we all uh, realized throughout this day how important these archives are, although they're apparently not very sexy. They're uh, under-resourced. Um, uh, there is little interest. And we hope that with this conference and, and coming uh, similar events, we raise a bit the interest and um, what seems very important to us and uh, it um, came, became evident to me as well, the dialogue between the archival world and the dealing with the past world is important and I think um, there are very specific issues to discuss with relation to those very specific um, archives and so we hope to uh, continue and to um, to trigger the discussion also with uh, the things we are going uh, to publish, the study on um, archives of truth, truth commissions. And so we hope to, to keep in touch and um, 
in the future with uh, similar um, conferences and events. So thanks to all of you.